I don't add that many new supplements to my routine nowadays. I'm focusing only on the top 10 or so of the key supplements that I think have the evidence and will improve my personal goals. However, there are a few supplements that I've added over the past few weeks into my routine, which I'm going to share with you in this video. And I wish I did it sooner actually to gain those benefits. Number one is astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is a carotenoid that gives salmon its pink red color. It's a very powerful antioxidant that has 6,000 times higher antioxidant potential than vitamin C and 100 to 500 times higher than vitamin E. I've obviously known about astaxanthin for many years, but recently I stumbled upon several meta-analyses of human randomized controlled trials that showed how astaxanthin has quite a lot of health benefits. There are many clinical trials on humans showing astaxanthin has anti-inflammatory, cardioprotective and neuroprotective qualities. A 2022 meta-analysis of clinical trials showed astaxanthin lowers total cholesterol, systolic blood pressure marginally and significantly lowers LDL cholesterol in people at high risk of metabolic syndrome. Another 2021 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials saw that astaxanthin supplementation lowered diastolic blood pressure in people with high blood pressure. One particularly interesting effect of astaxanthin is its protective effects against oxidized fats. A 2022 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that astaxanthin significantly lowered malondialdehyde, which is a marker of lipid peroxidation that reflects oxidative stress. These effects were particularly significant significant in people with type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetics also saw a reduction in other inflammatory markers such as interleukin-6. These are all benefits in people with poor metabolic health. I don't have poor metabolic health by any means and I do think that the benefits of astaxanthin against oxidized fats is amazing. The thing that got me really interested in astaxanthin were its skin anti-aging benefits. Astaxanthin can protect your skin against excessive UV radiation from the sun. A 2021 systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that oral astaxanthin supplementation was able to improve skin moisturization and elasticity. Another 2021 review of clinical trials saw that astaxanthin improved photo-aged skin. Skin health is more than just vanity. It's also a reflection of your speed of biological aging and overall health. And last but not least, astaxanthin also has life extension data from animal models. A recent 2023 the National Institute on Aging Interventions testing program saw that astaxanthin extended the lifespan of male mice by 12%. Now the 12% doesn't sound like a lot, but the ITP studies are generally very well done. And there aren't many over-the-counter supplements that have even any data about life extension. Another 2019 study on roundworms saw that astaxanthin extended lifespan by 20% by affecting mitochondrial function. So astaxanthin has a very broad spectrum effect on systemic aging by affecting your brain function, heart function, your skin health, and many other things. Oh, and did I forget to mention that astaxanthin is also a senolytic, which means that it eliminates senescent zombie cells that accumulate during aging. This is the reason why I added astaxanthin to my supplement routine. It's got a lot of human clinical trials and animal studies showing its benefits. Unfortunately, like with fish oil, astaxanthin can be often contaminated with pollutants from the sea. Usually astaxanthin is harvested from krill, which is quite a clean source of omega-3s and astaxanthin. However, Nordco just came out with their brand new ultimate omega formula, harvested from phytoplankton, which makes it much lower in pollutants and more environmentally sustainable. Nordco's omega formula contains a clinically relevant dose of astaxanthin, as well as DHA and EPA, the main omega-3 fatty acids. This is the astaxanthin I'm taking because it's high quality and lab tested. Head over to livehealthy.com forward slash collections forward slash Nordco with two O's and use the code SEAM10 for a 10% discount. Number two is B vitamins. So I've never taken B12 or B complex in my life because I never thought that I need to and uh, I'm an omnivore so I eat foods that contain B vitamins. However, a few weeks ago I got a comprehensive blood panel and showed my homocysteine levels were slightly higher than what's optimal. All my other markers for cardiovascular disease like cholesterol, ApoB, inflammation and LPA were optimal but my homocysteine was 12 micromoles per liter which isn't bad but it's not the lowest risk either. High homocysteine levels are a risk factor for heart disease and ideally it should be below 10 micromoles. A 2017 meta-analysis of prospective studies found that homocysteine levels are associated with higher all-cause mortality risk in a linear fashion with every 5 micromole increase in homocysteine increasing the risk by 33.6%. So ideally your homocysteine should be closer to 5 rather than 12. There are some possible genetic reasons why someone's homocysteine levels could be elevated 
related, it has to do with methylation and even exercise can increase your homocysteine levels because I do exercise a lot and I might have some poor methylation genes. But I do eat plenty of B vitamins from my dietary sources. And the blood work also showed that my B vitamins were generally normal. As a way to try and get my homocysteine levels lower, I added a B complex to my routine. I'm already taking a lot of the other supplements that help to lower homocysteine, such as glycine and trimethylglycine, but I've never taken a B supplement in my life before, so I decided to test it. I also found research that omnivores who eat meat are still at a high risk of B12 deficiency. A 2018 Adventist health study saw that vegan participants had the highest B12 levels. They had 292 picograms per milliliter, compared to the omnivores 256 picograms per milliliter. The biggest predictor of serum B12 levels was B12 supplementation, independent of dietary B12 source. So the reason the vegans had the highest B12 levels was that they're more likely to supplement with B12 because they know that they're not getting it from their food. Whereas omnivores, they think that they're getting B12 from their meat and they don't supplement it, so their B12 levels were lower. The reason meat doesn't even contain that much B12 anymore is because of antibiotics that kill the B12 producing bacteria in farm animals. A 2013 meta-analysis saw that doubling dietary B12 intake only increased B12 levels by 11%, 13% in the elderly and 8% in adults. So eating more B12 doesn't appear to raise your B12 levels that much. Number three are omega-3s. I have previously mentioned that I started taking omega-3s, but it's still a relatively new phenomenon for me because I haven't been taking any omega-3s for the last, you know, eight to 10 years. The reason I started taking omega-3s is because of, again, the research that I saw. Supplementing with omega-3s has been shown to reduce inflammation, reduce the risk of heart disease, also Alzheimer's and diabetes in dozens of clinical trials over the last few decades. I have made some videos about omega-3s before, but here are the highlights of the biggest studies. A 2024 meta-analysis of clinical trials found that omega-3 supplementation improves heart function, reduces inflammation, and decreases the risk of heart disease events in patients of heart failure. A 2020 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials concluded that omega-3s might improve insulin sensitivity and lipid metabolism in type 2 diabetics. Again, I don't have any of those problems, but there's also a lot of research about about the protective effects of omega-3s against heart disease and neurodegeneration and even old cause mortality. A 2021 analysis discovered that people with the highest blood levels of EPA and DHA, which are the main omega-3 fats, had a 15 to 18 percent lower risk of total mortality and they were 9 to 21 percent less likely to die from heart disease compared to the individuals with the lowest levels. The amount of EPA and DHA in red blood cells is called the omega-3 index and if your omega-3 index is low then that is considered a risk factor for heart disease, neurodegeneration, and all-cause mortality. The optimal omega-3 index associated with the lowest risk is somewhere between 8 to 12 percent, and an omega-3 index below 4 percent is linked to higher risk. People with the highest omega-3 index, over 6.8 percent compared to those with the lowest, less than 4.2 percent, have been seen to have a 33 percent lower risk of all-cause mortality and 39 percent lower risk of incident cardiovascular disease. I recently tested my omega-3 index and got a result of 9%, which is in the lowest risk category. My omega-6 to 3 ratio was also 2.7 to 1, which is also in the lowest risk category. However, my goal is to get an omega-3 index of at least 11% and ideally 12%. And the only reliable method of getting there is omega-3 supplementation. Like I said, I haven't been taking any omega-3s for the last 8 to 10 years, so the problem is that it takes quite a long time to increase your omega-3 index because your red blood cells, they have a turnover rate of six months. This means that it takes months to raise your omega-3 index, so it's better to like start immediately. A 2022 study also found that the risk of Alzheimer's disease among the highest red blood cell DHA quantile over 6.1% was 49% lower compared to the lowest quantile, less than 3.8% in fully adjusted models. My results were 6.3% for DHA, which is the highest group but I wish it was a bit higher. So I'm taking the omega-3s from Nordcode to increase my omega-3 index. And it's a low contamination and low oxidized source. Number four is hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid, also called hyaluronan, it is a gooey substance found in the skin, joints, organs, and connective tissue. It maintains hydration of the tissue by making them hold onto water. Hyaluronic acid in the skin starts decreasing after the age of 25, and a 75-year-old person has one-fourth of the hyaluronic acid as someone who's 19 years old. Like with collagen, it's something you don't want to play catch-up with because it's much better to be ahead of the curve. Oral supplementation of hyaluronic acid in human clinical trials has found that it significantly reduces 
wrinkles and dryness compared to placebo. In a 2021 randomized controlled trial, they found that 120 milligrams per day of hyaluronic acid for 12 weeks improved skin condition and decreased wrinkles in 40 healthy Asian people between the ages of 35 and 64. Another 2017 clinical trial saw similar results, but a higher molecular weight hyaluronic acid showed greater effects. Again, skin aging and wrinkles are much more important than just the aesthetics. It's also a reflection of biological aging. Overall, these are the supplements that I've added to my routine over the past few weeks and months. Like I said, I wouldn't take them unless they had the clinical evidence. I'm not saying that you need to take them, but they do have evidence that they work. If you want to know the top longevity supplements to take, then check out my recent video about it. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. Thanks for watching. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.